Welcome, and welcome back, everybody, to the OK Grognard Show. It is Thursday, March 18th, 2021, 10 a.m. Central, in beautiful Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. So, we've been diving back in a bit to the first edition, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons Dungeon Master's Guide, and today we're going to continue with that. Pick up a few sections that we didn't get last year. I don't think we ever had a show about death. And I thought, you know, death is kind of linked to hit points, and there's a certain end section of the hit points section that deals with characters dying, and I wanted to include that, but I didn't want to leave out the rest of the hit points section. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to do a show, or more than one show, that connects the two portions of the DMG and does so in multiple parts if necessary, but includes them both under the heading of Death and Hit Points. So this is Death and Hit Points Part 1, and we'll check that out, starting with... What do we got here? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Death in the DMG. That could be a title of a murder mystery book. If we wanted it to be, let's see if we can slide me over a little bit. There's not a lot of room when that big old DMG is up there. So we will look at that. Starting off with death. The character faces death in many forms. The most common, death due to combat, is no great matter in most cases, for the character can often be brought back by means of a clerical spell or an alter reality or wish. Of course, recovery of damage sustained might be a problem, but that is not insurmountable. Death due to age. This is a serious matter, for unless the lifespan can, be otherwise, uh, can otherwise be prolonged, the character brought back from such death faces the prospect of soon dying again. Beyond the maximum age determined for the character in question, no form of magic which does not prolong life, lifespan will work. Thus, some characters may become liches. Of course, multiple potions of longevity, wishes, and Possibly magical devices will allow a greatly extended lifespan. But once a character dies due to old, venerable age, then it is all over. If you make this clear, many participants will see the continuity of the family line as a way to achieve a sort of immortality. True in real life too, right? Uh, just to take a quick... Uh, look at this section and talk about a couple of points within it they talk about thus some characters may become liches this obviously means that those characters would become evil or in all likelihood were evil to begin with because taking on the uh just taking the idea of becoming a lich into your head, becoming an undead, spell-casting, evil creature, does kind of presuppose that you're evil to begin with. Um, I should say in my own campaign, since I don't allow evil characters, if someone were to take on that sort of thing, they would be uh, relegating their character to the piles of NPCs, which I run, NPCs and monsters, at the point at which they became such, or at the end of the session in which they became such. I did have this happen once. <clears throat> a friend of mine, Dave, who uh, was in a game in which I... Uh, ran him through a few scenarios as his character was getting older, decided he wanted to uh, seek lichdom. He did it toying around at first. He wasn't an evil character to begin with. He was um, a chaotic neutral cleric. 
and uh, well, he was toying around with it, but he was looking into it, and I gave him the opportunity to do it, and he did, <clears throat> in fact, follow through with it and become a lich, and uh, it also happened to be on the brink of when a campaign was about to culminate, and although all of them were in the process of destroying a monster, a creature that they had uh, been working themselves up to, I think they were like 18th level characters, and this was a third edition game. Hey, Hobbsy, how you doing, buddy? The uh, That big battle went on, they completed that, and there was a great object there which was just the sort of thing which could be used as a phylactery. The high-level cleric completed his own ritual and used that object that they had garnered in this final battle, which was going to be the end of the campaign, turned himself into a lich, and then turned on the party. And there was yet another huge campaign-ending battle and it was uh, quite the thing, too, because he was a very powerful cleric to begin with. And once he had added lichdom into his bag of tricks, he became crazy powerful and nearly defeated the party. I think a couple of the, I think two out of the other five characters, uh, no, two out of the other four, because there were five players total, um, wound up dying in the ensuing battle. Quite, a, quite an ordeal. Um, we mentioned in here potions of longevity, wishes, and possibly magical devices can extend life. Certainly potions of longevity are a staple of first edition AD&D. And uh, wishes, <clears throat> while a lot more rare, uh, also uh, have the possibility of going sideways on you, so... Depending how you word them, they might be a dangerous prospect for extending your lifespan. Magical devices, of course, DMs can create all sorts of things on their own. And uh, certainly magic users can create some devices that might extend their own lives, uh, develop a magic item, imbue it with... Uh, Certain spells that could work that way, probably a wish, but maybe others, uh, maybe some combination of spells works toward doing just the sort of thing that uh, you can, you, know, you don't want to create like a an iron lung and find yourself not being able to go about your business. I suppose there might be a situation where you create something like that from sort of stasis chamber and then project yourself into a surrogate uh, maybe maybe a golem or some other creature some construct uh, that is then able to go around with the party but uh, well, there's a lot of considerations to be made there well let's continue Determination of maximum age, which we just talked about. And here's a weird thing, too, right? Because this is information you probably want to keep from the actual character or the uh, player. I think the DM needs to have this information, maybe, if it starts to become relevant. But you don't want, uh, without some sort of uh, divination magic being used... You want the player to be able to know when he's going to die of natural causes, he or she. Unless the character dies of some other cause, he or she will live to old age. Use the following table to find the exact age at which a character will die of natural causes. Maximum character age table. There it is. Notice a uh, percentage dice roll on the left, old lowest age, old highest age, venerable. These, of course, are categories that are on the table elsewhere in the DMG, which determine the starting age or the age of a character or an NPC. 
uh, plus or minuses there, plus a d8 on that one, minus a d4 on that one, d6, d10. Asterisk, use a die to determine the additional addition or subtraction according to the span of years in the category under 100. One year intervals, 10 year intervals, or 20 year intervals, that's what these dice will roll. Treat rolls of zero <clears throat> as not rather than 10 when using the 10 cider. So, in effect, a random number between 0 and 9 is generated. Treat a die roll results as 20 on the d20 as not. So, it generates a number between 0 and 19. Examples of maximum age determination. Hey, look, it's Carlos in there. Oh, there you go. Hey, and Coriolis, too. Hey, thanks for this up there, Carlos. Very nice of you. Coriolis Storm says, one of my friends made a bunch of simulacrums for his character and then just stayed safely at home. <laughs> there you go. Constructs, project yourself into them and go have a uh, go have an adventure vicariously through your through your uh, through your little Pinocchio examples of maximum age determination the dice rolled indicate the dwarf character will live to old age lowest figure plus d8 as the span considers 100 years, the D8 stands for decades, so the character will live 251 years plus 10 to 80 years plus 0 to 9 years. The same dwarf is considered to considered above. The same dwarf considered above is to live to old age. Highest figure minus 4. The variable is minus 10 to minus 40 years minus zero to minus nine years so th these dice are cumulative you add them up so old age and then venerable age adds a separate additional roll the dice roll for the half orc character for a half orc character indicate that he will live to venerable age highest age d20 plus d20 as the span is considered 100 years a character will live for 80 years, plus 0 to 19 years, or 80 to 99 years. As a result of 20 equals 0, added to the maximum venerable age shown for the character race. That I shown show that a high elf carrier will live to venerable age, lowest figure, plus d6. As the span of years for that character is 400 years, the character will live to be 1,201 plus 20 to 120 years plus 0 to 19 years or to an age of 1,221 to 1,340 years. Assume that the D6 shows a 4, so 80 years are added. 4 times 20 is 80 to bring the lifespan to 1281. 1201 plus 80. And then a d20 is rolled. A 0 comes up. So the total lifespan is 1281 years. 1201 plus 80 plus 0. 1201. 1281. All right. Well, that's a crazy mix. Not too tough to figure out if you want to spend the time on it. We'll move on, though. Any character brought back from such a state, this is death due to disease or disorder or parasitic infestation. Any character brought back from such a state will suffer the ravages of the disease or infestation, permanent losses in ability, for example, until magically countered. Furthermore, such a character will be 90% likely to, uh, wait for it, still be suffering from the cause of death unless a curative is used. Even then, the character will have to spend time recovering 
as if from a severe illness, ability losses which have been permanently sustained will not be corrected by a curative of any sort, including a cure disease spell. Magical corrections, wishes, alter reality spells, and magical devices will certainly correct those deficiencies. So there you have it. <clears throat> that is the section on death. Of course, we also want to go into the section on hit points. Carlos says, Carlos of Castle Entertainment says, it's fascinating. On one hand, you have DMs telling you, don't even bother writing a background for your character. On the other hand, you can go as in-depth as knowing when you're going to die to the year. And, you know, with a 12-sider and a 30-sider, you can get it down to the day. You can go to the, the minute if you want. But, again, you know, you probably want this information only in the hands of the DM. I suppose, as I was saying before, with the right divination magic, you might allow the character to uh, sleuth out when the moment of his death will come of old age. Uh, you know, with the caveat that uh, that doesn't mean you can go out and you're invulnerable until then. You still have to have the chance of dying uh, from inflicted wounds during combat if uh, if you're going out and getting yourself putting yourself in harm's way. You can't just be jumping off cliffs suddenly on top of that but it's all uh it's all possible in D&D &D, right it just depends how much the DM wants to wants to get into it uh, on their own and once you get there once you know that that the DM can do whatever they want within reason certainly um if you're a DM that just kills characters all the time, then you're probably going to find that your players are uninterested in continuing to play with you very much, right? But for the most part, DMs are uh, able to run their games the way they wish. And if they want to have that level of detail, absolutely they'll be able to go into it with their players and their players hopefully are buying in at that point if they're aware of what the rules are and how the game was played then certainly they're going to allow a dm a certain amount of uh leeway in what they're doing um sometimes without question sometimes you're going to want to ask a dm hey what gives this isn't uh, this isn't what I was expecting when playing this character, but or this wasn't the, this wasn't the way I expected certain rules to work. But uh, certainly there could be multiple interpretations to rules. Sometimes those rules can be more forgiving toward player characters, and sometimes they can be tougher on them. You never know how it's going to work out at any given table with any given DM. Well, we got another section on hit points. We're not too far along in the show. We can dive into this, too. I know we were going to do a part one and part two. Coriolis Storm says, I wonder how often old age has come up as a relevant factor in campaigns. I would guess it's pretty rare. Uh, as I said, I, I had one character who was... Uh, going toward that after losing some years to uh to uh was it a mummy that uh aged them quite a bit and as a human and they were already getting pretty old the campaign had had uh, a number of breaks in it where the characters took some time off as they were uh researching different things so the characters did age during the course of the campaign quite a bit and this is what led to 
the uh, player of the cleric character opting to look into lichdom as an alternative to to dying. And he did not actually die of old age because he turned himself into a lich before then. Carlos says, I know a lot of people that play magic user clerics that try to exploit it. They uh, getting the bonus intelligence wisdom as they get older. Yeah, absolutely. The uh, that's a great point. The first edition uh, rules uh, drop you off in in uh, strength and constitution as you get older, but they elevate your wisdom and intelligence. And if you're a magic user with a 16, 15 even intelligence, and you can only cast spells up to a certain level of spell up to a certain spell level um, there's a limit there based on your intelligence but if you're able to increase your intelligence even by just getting older uh, then you can increase that there uh, wisdom too uh, gets uh, higher as you get older and there are some limits on the bonus spells you get based on your wisdom and of course uh, saving throws too and if your wisdom goes up well you'll, you'll get those extra benefits from from that you'll lose a bit of strength and constitution but who says you can't min max in first edition says Carlos well nobody says you can't and uh I have absolutely done a little bit of that myself in certain situations. Although for the most part, once I'm in character, once the character's going, um, I guess, well, we're still going up levels. First edition doesn't, uh, doesn't do a whole bunch of uh, min-maxing as you go up in levels because unlike later editions where you're picking and choosing from sort of... Uh, feet or skill trees um, you're not doing a lot of that in first edition you're reaching milestones and gaining some stuff but there's not a lot of individual choices as you go up I think we all have no shame in that no 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 of course not no shame in wanting to make your character more powerful certainly it's not just a goal of the player uh, as adventurers most uh, adventuring characters should have goals too and sometimes that's going to manifest in the character wanting to be a better whatever they are a fighter is going to want to be stronger and tougher and be able to be a more accomplished fighter and magic users going to want to unlock more more arcane secrets uh, learn more spells learn to cast more spells learn to create magic items and become more powerful through utilizing all of those uh, all of those talents clerics of course want to rise up, rise up through their temple hierarchy as well as uh, be able to cast the highest levels of spells and to be able to uh, bring more to the table it may mean more in regard to their alignment if that's heavily used in certain campaigns even if it's only lightly used Certainly, uh, clerics are geared toward using those uh, those gains toward the furtherance of their temples' causes and even their uh, characters' causes as dictated by the philosophy behind their own alignment. And let's not forget thieves. Well, we're talking about all of our character classes. Somewhere out there, there's a uh, thieves' guild that could uh, could stand to be run by a player character with a higher level of ability to uh, be proud of I'm sure there's a certain pride factor in becoming the leader of a thieves guild because let's face it thieves tend to be loners in the group <laughs> if you could say that uh, they tend to be individuals who become a uh, member of an adventuring party uh, as a convenience 
so and maybe I'm putting my own putting my own uh, foibles to the fore here by saying that's the way thieves operate or tend to operate but it may be true certainly uh, druids have it baked into their character class DNA that uh, at those higher levels there could only be one and uh, they have to uh, vanquish whoever is holding the title um, the great druid before they can become the great druid so it's an old uh, is it George Frazier the golden bow there's a whole uh, section of that book in regard to uh, I'm sure this is where Gary and others got the idea of druids knocking off their predecessor Maybe look that up if you're looking for something interesting to read over this weekend. Well, you know what? We're not going to dive into hit points. We will save that for the next time because we're beyond the 26-minute mark at this point, and that's a whole section, and if we open it up and don't complete it, we'll feel like we've uh, short-sheeted the, the group here. So, we will say, hey, Coriolis Storm, quick comment. Oh, wow, I just noticed the mention of Rasputin on that page. Indeed, yeah, they bring up Rasputin in the hit points section. I'd never heard of him before reading the DMG. I discovered so many interesting facts reading it back in the 80s. Yeah, that's right. What's that emoji? Is that a little smiley face in a, in a cupcake wrapper? <laughs> that's pretty neat. Hey, George, welcome. George got here late. We'll have to rewatch the show later. Yep, it'll be up on YouTube in about a half hour or so. Carlos mentioned Gary taught us all a thing or two for sure. No doubt about it. There's a lot of things to learn or at least uh, a lot of things that will pique the imagination when reading through the DMG and uh, following up on that and reading further. Of course, back in the 70s, you had to have a set of uh, set of encyclopedias to dive in to get a lot of that information or a handy library nearby. Happy Muffin is the name of the emoji there. That's pretty neat. I like that. There you go. George saying hi to Carlos. Glad you're all there. Oh, Sad Muffin too. <laughs> Those are funny. Well, I want to thank everybody for... Oh, hey, Bob. Henry Armitage here too. Thank everybody for popping into the show. I'll have it up on YouTube in about a half hour or so. doesn't take that long. But I do want to thank you all for popping in and for chiming in on the chat. Help you make the show even more fun and better. And more better fun. Let's say that. Let's put it that way. Nothing wrong with that. About to go to bed. Oh, yeah, third shifter, huh? Appreciate it. Wanted to support Mark, though, since I was up late. Appreciate that, Carlos. Thank you very much. Carlos also uh, has a really cool ad in the upcoming OS zine, which is uh, getting dangerously close to completion. We'll see, uh, see if we can't finish that off in the very near future. Gary Conn right around the corner. Don't forget, if you haven't already, you need to sign up for events. Um, starts up next Thursday. I'll be playing Divine Right Thursday evening. I'll do the show again next Thursday during the uh, early part of the day. So if you're not an event, please pop around. Everybody here, you have a great day and a great weekend. I also want to say... Death and Hit Points, Part 1 from the first edition, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, Dungeon Master Guide. We'll get back into Hit Points on the next show next Thursday. This has been the OK Grognard Show. Don't forget, you can come check it out live streaming on Monday and Thursday on Twitch at 10 a.m. Central. And we talk about many different things on 
Thursday, we definitely do uh, rules-oriented or inside-the-game shows, and on Mondays, we tend to do meta shows outside the game, talks about conventions, products sometimes, that sort of thing. If you are catching up on... Yeah, if you're here on Twitch, make sure to follow the channel. If you catch up with it on YouTube, then please do subscribe to the channel. Give us a thumbs up on any videos you watch and enjoy, and please do feel free to leave comments. Constructive criticism is always helpful. Just want to get into the conversation. Make a comment about the topic at large, then please do. This has been the OK Grognard Show from beautiful Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. Bye-bye.